Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Stoltz. I am the Director of Leadership Programs here at George Washington's Mount Vernon, and I'm also our resident military historian. Uh, thank you all for uh, watching our brief presentation, uh, which will be called Yorktown. Er, uh, now what? Um, you know, I think the th what, what's always sort of fascinating is for me as a historian is how people seem to have uh, sort of a truncated timeline in their heads of the American Revolution, which is actually one of the longer wars that the United States has ever been involved in. Uh, I think there's sort of the popular general public tends to think Lexington and Concord, uh, maybe uh, 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 Trenton and Princeton, maybe Saratoga, Yorktown, yay, democracy. And uh, right, it's an eight year war. So one, it'll took a little longer than those brief bullet points sound. But I think what we also fail to sort of realize is that basically one quarter of the war occurs after Yorktown, right? Because 18, uh, 1781 uh, to 1783, when the final treaty uh, is signed. So it, there's sort of an interesting, I think, story to be told about those last few years of the war and exactly what Washington uh, and the British uh, and, and just everyone involved in the conflict are doing, because none of them know that the war is going to end in 1783. None of them know that treaty negotiations are going to begin in uh, 1782. So they really wrap up Yorktown knowing that, okay, something big has happened, but it really kind of remains to be seen just how big that will be or what other uh, shoes will need to drop. So in this uh, sort of brief presentation, uh, we are gonna look at everything that happens after Yorktown. And now, of course, being a historian, I am contractually obligated to having just said all that, go back before even the period I actually want to talk about to provide uh, some context. Um, what I'll sort of start with, is, or, or, or want to point out, is, is that Yorktown was sort of an accident in the sense of Yorktown, uh, the place uh, there in Southern Virginia, was strategically unimportant to the American war effort, uh, to the British war effort, to the French war effort. Uh, Yorktown is essentially just a place that the British army was sitting at waiting for the Royal Navy to come pick them up. For all intents and purposes, the British Corn Lord Cornwallis and his friends are just sitting there waiting for their Uber ride to show up, their Uber being the Royal Navy. Um, they had had a series of defeats in uh, South Carolina and North Carolina and a series of victories as well. But on the whole, there things aren't going so well for old Lord Cornwallis and friends. Uh, they're short on supplies. Uh, guys like Nathaniel Green uh, have been running circles around them with their army. So even though uh, Cornwallis is winning at different battles in the strategic sense, he is actually uh, very much on the defensive by uh, 1781. Meanwhile, there's a guy named George Washington that I would suspect that a lot of our viewers here uh, watching a Mount Vernon uh, web page uh, and social media stream are familiar with. Uh, and I think what's interesting and sort of left out with a lot of the general narratives of the war is why Washington's not south in this period of 1780, 1781. Washington and the main Continental Army are still encamped uh, at West Point, New York, keeping an eye on the main British Army which is sitting in the main British base of New York City, right? So the British have sent out expeditions south trying to lure Washington and the Continental Main Army south. They haven't actually successfully done that yet uh, by 1781. So uh, Washington still very much sees sort of the center of gravity, if you will, of the American war effort as largely centered on New York City. And the reason why is because he's trying to keep the attention of that main British force in New York City, right? If the British ever pull too many troops out of New York City, Washington can try and retake the main British base. And it really doesn't matter for the British if they've captured something like Charleston, if in exchange for capturing Charleston, they've lost New York. Um, so Washington never quite takes the bait. He always keeps the main Continental Army, it's literally referred to that as the main army, uh, always keeps it within striking distance of New York City, except for one occasion. 
uh, for the back half of the war. And that's the expedition to Yorktown. Now, even then, Yorktown was not the primary American goal for that campaign year. The Americans, like I said, were largely encamped in West Point, New York. The French, prior to Yorktown, are encamped at uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Those two places are not that far from New York City, which, as I said, is the main British base. And so part of the original thinking for 1781 uh, will be to attack New York City. Now, Washington and Rochambeau, the French commander, will eventually decide not to do that after they sort of get a, a real feel for what would be involved with attacking New York City. Uh, and they will decide to look for other options, which is how they'll end up with running down to Yorktown. But again, their only reason for going to Yorktown has nothing to do with the city or town of Yorktown. They're there to try and capture the 8,000 British troops that are stranded at Yorktown because the French have actually done something the French don't normally do in the 18th century, and that's beat the Royal Navy on the high seas. And so these British soldiers, about 8,000 of them, are left stranded at Yorktown. And so the entire siege of Yorktown uh, is really just there to take prisoner uh, this large formation of British soldiers so that they cannot be brought to some place like New York City, which was way more strategically important to uh, the American war effort. Um, so that's all exciting. Now, at the end of the war, or, or uh, 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 not at the end of the war, um, while they're having those discussions about do we, do we not attack New York City, one of the things the Americans and the French will realize, and especially the Americans, is that the American army was not trained to do amphibious warfare. We'll come back to that in a moment, but suffice to say, if you're going to attack something like New York City that's incredibly surrounded by rivers, it helps if you know how to do uh, amphibious attacks. But hold on to that for a moment. Point is, Yorktown is a successful Franco-American operation, as you see on the screen. Uh, famous painting of the surrender of the British Army there at Yorktown. And now they have to figure, Americans and the French have to figure out what they're going to do the remainder of that year. Now, what most people, because we tend to, with the general narrative of the war, just kind of skip over the next two years. Um, what most people don't realize is that basically as soon as Washington gets uh, that sword that the British are going to surrender right there, he hauls butt with the entire American army under his command back north as quick as they can back into West Point, New York, back behind the fortifications there so that one, the British army cannot try and sneak out of New York City and take the American fortifications at West Point. But two, he always wants to have the opportunity to attack New York City. So they rush the American army back up uh, to get them back in position. Now, there is still a large Amer or fairly large American force operating in the South under Nathaniel Green. Uh, that is trying to retake uh, cities like Charleston and Savannah that Cornwallis and, and other British officers had captured uh, a few years before uh, during what's called the Southern Campaign. The French will actually spend the winter of 1781 to 1782 in Williamsburg, uh, Virginia. They will actually uh, continue to stay there in uh, right near Yorktown, so that as the situation unfolds, uh, as they get into the 1781, into 1782, the French army is in a position to help either Green or Washington, depending on uh, the circumstances. So the French actually hang out uh, in Williamsburg all winter. Uh, the French commander, Rochambeau, uh, will actually become friends with the president of William and Mary College uh, there in Williamsburg. Uh, Rochambeau does not speak any English, uh, somewhat oddly in some ways, uh, the president of William and Mary does not speak any French for a highly educated person in the 18th century. That would have been a little odd, but he was a highly educated person in the middle of the 18th century, which means he was good with his Latin, which Rochambeau being a good Catholic boy, uh, was also good with his Latin. So actually Washington... Rochambeau and, uh, and uh, the president of William & Mary will become friends uh, chatting over Latin throughout the winter of 1781-1782. So that's just fun fact. So, you know, they call it a dead language, but you never know when it might be useful for weird winter guests. 
so like I said, the French will spend the entire winter 1781-72 in, uh, in, in uh, Williamsburg while Washington is sort of figuring out, are we going to have the chance to go after New York City uh, in 72? Because again, no one has any clue that the British will eventually call it quits uh, and want to seek peace. Um, so Washington will spend the winter of 1782, uh, 1781 to 72, working with the American army on a number of, of things uh, in terms of training. And, and one of the things that's stuck in Washington's head is as they were thinking through uh, that possible attack on New York City in 1781, that one of the things the Continental Army was not trained to do was amphibious assaults. They had built a bunch of boats throughout 1781 uh, thinking that they would attack New York City, uh, but they hadn't really done a whole lot of training of how to attack contested beachheads. Um, and what they realized uh, as they did a big reconnaissance in 1781 was that they were basically going to have to uh, hit beaches in the face of active British fire. So Washington will begin training up the Continental Army uh, throughout that winter and into the spring of 1782, uh, in amphibious operations, and they will actually uh, have a massive training exercise uh, when they move the army from West Point a little further south to what's called Verplanck's Point, which if anybody's watching this uh, from the New York City area or or uh, just are familiar with their sort of lower Hudson River, geography for Planck's Point is basically at the north end of the Toppen Z, right, big open body of water uh, there in the Hudson River. And Washington will say, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, there's always opportunities for good training. We have to move the entire army to Verplanck's point anyway. Why don't we practice this whole amphibious thing? And so they will actually load, basically combat load the entire Continental Army at West Point into these boats, uh, sail them down the river in formation uh, in an organized sense, uh, and then will arrange themselves in line of battle uh, to land at Verplanck's point and move in, uh, again, in line of battle. So they actually, you know, are, are all there in their boats. The boats all hit the beach at roughly the same time. The entire American army, which is about like 5,000 people, disembarks out of the boats and proceeds to move inland in line of battle uh, to where they're camp at Verplanck's point. So just always a good opportunity to do some practice, do some training. Um, now, fortunately, unfortunately, Kind of depends on your, your theory here. None of this will ever actually get used. Um, in the April of 1782 is going to be what's called the Battle of the Saints, which is a large naval battle that most histories of most histories of the American Revolution written by Americans tend to leave out because this is really the point where the war has gone global. And so uh, you know, the 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 flip side of the coin to involving the French in the war is that you turn it into, you turn the American Revolutionary War into a global war, right? The United States' portion of that war is a revolutionary war against, uh, Brit against Britain seeking political independence. The French, the Spanish, the Dutch, all these different European powers that Franklin and Washington have encouraged to come into the war on the American side, they don't really care about American independence, right? They're there to try and take uh, British colonial possessions. The war had not been going well for the British uh, throughout 1780 into 1781 uh, in the Caribbean. Um, the French Navy was about half the size of the Royal Navy. Spanish Navy is about half the size of the Royal Navy. Now, I'm just a humanities major, but once those two come into the war on the same side, that means the Royal Navy now is facing about the same number of ships as they have. And then the British will actually get the Dutch even annoyed enough to come into the war. So actually by 1782, it's the point where the British Navy is outnumbered on sea, which if you're the British is a situation you never want to be in because that's actually your entire uh, defense policy revolves around the Navy. Britain is terrified that they might start to lose a number of colonial possessions. And in fact, uh, it had not been going so well for them prior uh, in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, I just flipped back a second. You can see on this map, uh, you notice that New Orleans, Mobile, and Pensacola, New Orleans, Louisiana, Mobile, Alabama, and Pensacola, Florida uh, are all marked with a little Spanish flag. Um, those had been British when the American Revolution uh, starts, with the exception of 
New Orleans. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of Bernardo de Galvez, Bernardo de Galvez a, a, a Spanish general, will basically roll up the entire British army uh, along what's now the American Gulf Coast. Uh, the French had captured a number of British islands in the Caribbean. And so the British are really on their back heel uh, in the Caribbean, so much so that by 1782, the French and the Spanish are planning a joint invasion of Jamaica, which is the most important colony for the British in North America. If the British lose Jamaica, it, it's not going to be good for the British, right? The, you're, you're, you're talking uh, a, a complete meltdown of the British economy, it's it, it, a complete collapse of the empire, potentially. Uh, the, I mean, the ministry was going to go no matter what. Uh, the ministry flipped after uh, Yorktown as it is. But I mean, Britain would have just been an absolute political chaos if they'd lost Jamaica. That will never happen because there will be this battle called the Battle of the Saints in 1782, which will be a British victory, which is really the only reason Jamaica doesn't get invaded by the British or by the um the Spanish and the French. And so this will kind of be the point where finally the European powers are all willing to start to come to peace. Uh, more or less after Yorktown, like I said, the British ministry fails in, in, in falls in London. Uh, it, really, it's just the British aren't ready to commit, uh, 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 would, have, would have been sort of open to the idea of a peace treaty at that point, but it's really the French and the Spanish that want their chance to try and take things like Gibraltar, try and take things like Jamaica, right? The, the sort of European power politics that are you know, keeping the war going on a little longer. Uh, that will all be over with by 1782, right? It becomes clear that uh, the war has sort of reached a stalemate in the global sense. And so all sides will begin the process of beginning peace negotiations. That's a little problematic uh, it's good news, bad news uh, for the American army. One, hey, we might all be able to go home soon. The bad news is that there are a lot of unresolved issues uh, that have been continually boiling up. And we tend to, I think, think of the Continental Army as an organization very similar to the modern U.S. Army. Uh, and they're totally different organizations, actually. Uh, designed completely different, operating under different systems of government. And the Continental Army, there wasn't even just one Continental Army, as a number of you uh, are probably familiar with. Congress was very concerned about the idea of large standing armies uh, throughout the American Revolution, so much so that early in the war, they would only let soldiers sign up for one year at a time. And then eventually we'll uh, agree to let soldiers sign up for three years at a time. But what that means is there really wasn't a Continental Army because they had to keep rebuilding it so often, right? So there's a Continental Army for 1775. There's a Continental Army for 1776. Almost think of these as like graduating class cohorts. There is a Continental Army that'll serve from 1777 until 1780. Uh, and then there will have to be a Continental Army that serves from 1781 until what will end up becoming uh, the end of the war, right? 81, 82, 83. Every time they have to rebuild the army, they're having to go uh, stretch the recruiting more and more, so much so that the demographics of the Continental Army as an organization will change substantially from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. Beginning of the war, it's much more the Continental Army that sort of exists in myth and legend, right? A, a, you know, sort of middle class yeoman farmer defending hearth and home. By the end of white middle class farmer defending hearth and home. By the end of the war, uh, because recruiting is more and more of a challenge as the war is just dragged on longer and longer, uh, they have to go sort of farther down the depth chart, if you will, of who the different governments are, are having to go to to try and get people to, to have the manpower resources for the war. So much so that by the end of the war, about 20 to 25 percent of the Continental Army was almost definitely African-American. Over half the Continental Army are unpropertied, meaning they don't have any property or any possessions of any type, right? They don't own any land. Uh, these are just poorer people and, and they're a little more restless, right? They're being brought in with the idea of, of expanded rights after the war uh, goes on. Uh, they're being brought on for the idea of bounty payments, uh, right? They're there for some extra money that a bunch of these state and 
it's not the federal government yet, but the national government uh, don't really have the ability to pay them, right? The, the, the government wrote a lot of checks that it didn't actually have, it did, you know, the national government doesn't even have the ability to tax yet by this point. So it's not really clear on how they were planning to pay anything that they had um, had promised. And all this is, there's a few enlisted mutinies uh, pre and post Yorktown that are, are, are sort of famous, but this all sort of culminates in the late winter of 1783 uh, in Newburgh, New York, uh, with what's called the Newburgh Conspiracy. Now, uh, there's been a lot of great work done by some of our research fellows here in the Washington Library that have shown that there really wasn't actually much of a conspiracy that, that the officers weren't really that serious about uh, taking action against Congress. But Washington and Congress don't know that uh, in 1783, right? They, they don't actually know how, they're, how serious or not this is. They're just starting to get rumors of, of disaffected officers. Um, and so Washington will uh, eventually talk with everyone, get things sort of quieted down uh, and, and, and really begin the process of successfully demobilizing the wartime army, which was really important for civil military relations because you had people like uh, Madison, like Jefferson, others that are very small government types that are going to end up becoming uh, the Democratic Republican Party. They just thought that armies could not be trusted, right? They, they were, they were uh, a necessary tool at the time of the war, but that they need to be gotten rid of as quickly as possible. And it's almost kind of nice that by the end of the war, the people that are in the army aren't that terribly politically connected because that way it'll be easier to not pay them the benefits and stuff that they were promised later. Uh, now you will see the Federalist government, right? Uh, uh, in the Federalist party and, and the Washington administration later really trying to do right by the soldiers. But, uh, there were definitely political factions in the country uh, that that were um, not as as keen to pay some of those IOUs that they had brought up. Um, so I know this was all very rapid fire. I wish uh, with the format we had the ability to uh, to answer some questions, but I hope this just gives you a taste of uh, the tumultuous period that was the the last two years of the war. It's almost sort of like a duck on a pond in the sense of it's all very calm. It doesn't look like there's a lot going on in some ways, which is why a lot of the larger narratives of the war sort of skip over it. But it's the little duck feet uh, underneath. There's a lot going on that it's really a testament to Washington and, and the other leadership of the Continental Army and the national government that things didn't blow up uh, sort of more because there's a lot of ways that finishing and wrapping up the war could have gone uh, very differently uh, there's a whole weird situation with Washington and the French ambassador to the United States basically having to try and whip votes on the floor of Congress to get a peace treaty signed because you have freshman Congress members that are less than effective. Uh, but I hope this encourages you to uh, to go to look a little more into this period and uh, and learn a little more about it. So uh, thank you all for viewing uh, our, our talk today, and I hope to see you again soon.